We are not dealing with ordinary criminals. The real force is more sinister, more obscene than any monstrosity you can think of. Lord of corruption, master of the undead, Count Dracula. Kevin Given back with you once again for another episode of Comics Let's Talk. I want to remind you to check out my comic book reviews on both Comics for Sinners and Comic Crusaders websites. If you love comics as much as I do, you're going to subscribe to my channel. I review comics for Comic Crusaders. I also have my own franchises, Adolescent Radioactive Samurai Platypi and Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter. They're available on Comics Central, Indie Planet, and Comixology. Check them out. Stay tuned to this broadcast for more information. Also, like the Facebook pages for each franchise. Check out my Patreon site for some neat original artwork and shows that you won't find on YouTube. Here's part three of our show on Dracula. We're looking at Marvel Comics. Comics Tomb of Dracula today. From Wikipedia, The Tomb of Dracula is a horror comic book series published by Marvel Comics from April 1972 to August 1979. The 70-issue series featured a group of vampire hunters who fought Count Dracula and other supernatural menaces. On rare occasions, Dracula would work with these vampire hunters against a common threat or battle other supernatural threats on his own. But often, he was the antagonist rather than the protagonist. In addition to the supernatural battles in this series, Marvel's Dracula often served as a supervillain to other characters in the Marvel Universe. Looking at the original series, in 1971, the Comics Code Authority relaxed some of its long-standing rules regarding horror comics, such as a virtual ban on vampires. Marvel had already tested the waters with a quasi-vampire character, Morbius, the living vampire. But the company was now prepared to launch a regular vampire title as part of its new line of horror books. After some discussion, it was decided to use Dracula's character, in large part because it was the most famous vampire to the general public, because Bram Stoker's creation and secondary characters were by that time in the public domain. The series suffered from lack of direction for its first year. Most significantly, each of the first three issues was plotted by a different writer. Though Jerry Conway is credited as sole writer for issue one, the plot was written by Roy Thomas and editor Stan. And Lee, and Conway had no input into the issue until it had already been fully drawn. Conway could plot issue number two by himself and wrote a story heavily influenced by the British Hammer films, a striking departure from the first issue, which was derivative of the Universal Monster movies. Conway then quit the book due to an overabundance of writing assignments and was replaced by Archie Goodwin with issue number three. Goodwin quit after only two issues, but also made major changes to the series' direction, including the introduction of cast members Rachel Van Helsing and Taj Natal. Hall. New writer Gardner Fox took the series in yet another direction and introduced a romance between Frank Drake and Rachel Van Helsing, which would remain a subplot for the rest of the series. However, Thomas, who had by this time succeeded Lee as the editor of The Tomb of Dracula, felt that Fox's take did not work and took him off the book after only two issues. The title gained stability and hit its stride when Marv Wolfman became scripter with the seventh issue. The Wolfman himself has contended that he was floundering on the series until the story arc in issues number 12 through 14. Remarking, this storyline is when I finally figured out what the book was about. The Tyrano Tomb of Dracula was penciled by Gene Colan, with Tom Palmer inking all but issues 1, 2, and 8 through 11. Gil Kane drew many of the covers for the first few years, as he did for many other Marvel titles. Now let's listen to the creative team behind Dracula, as they discuss what made it work. Now nobody believes that to this day, I have never seen like the Bela Lugosi Dracula movie. I've seen very few vampire movies. At the time of, that I took over to Dracula, um, I had never seen any vampire movies. And that was the best thing that could have happened because my only information on, on Dracula was the Bram Stoker novel. And I love reading horror. Um, visual horror actually is too frightening. Uh, it's well done. Uh, so I don't intend to do that, but I like uh, when you read it, especially this Bram Stoker novel, because you're making up the visuals and you're making up the ideas in your head, and that's far more horrific 
in many ways. So if I'm going to do a Dracula series, I don't want to know this person's viewpoint of what Dracula should be or this person's viewpoint of what it should be. I took it from the guy who created it and yes. then I could be the first off of that rather than do a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy which each one gets worse. So the fact that I didn't fall into a lot of cliches is because I didn't know any of them. Mm. And I wasn't, you know, if I had seen all the Hammer films, it's very possible to a Dracula would have felt like a Hammer film. Right. Uh, because that would have been my knowledge. The Bram Stoker novel was, if it, has anyone here read the Bram Stoker? Good. So you know what I'm talking about. It's in the. It's not written like a regular book. It's written as letters to people back and forth, right, right. police blotters, uh, news reports. It's not told in the omniscient third person narrator type story. It's all first person from different points of view, and that's what I took from it to make the Tomb of Dracula book about the characters who are facing Dracula, mm -hmm. not the supreme evil himself. Right. And and when you did see Dracula, you never knew if he was lying or telling the truth. And generally, he was lying even to himself uh, because he was this type of character who was sort of soulless. My layouts were different. Uh, the the blacks that I put in were were all, I put in a lot of blacks, a lot of shadow, which adds to the drama of the piece. It's just the way I generally work. No matter what I'm doing, I I tend to do that. Uh, for all those that are familiar with Milton Kniff, who did Terry and the Pirates, my work is very similar uh, in that way. Uh, of course, when I did Tomb of Dracula, that was right up my alley, and I had plenty of opportunity for atmosphere. Colin, already one of Marvel's most well-established and prominent artists, said that he had lobbied for the assignment. When I heard Marvel was putting out a Dracula book, I confronted Stan Lee about it and asked him to let me do it. He didn't give me too much trouble, but... As it turned out, he took the promise away, saying he had promised it to Bill Everett. Well, right then and there, I auditioned for it. Stan didn't know what I was up to, but I spent a day at home and worked up a sample, using Jack Palance as my inspiration, and sent it to Stan. I got a call that very day. It's yours. Wolfman and Colin developed a bond while working on the series, on which they collaborated closely. Colin recalled, he'd give me a written plot, but he'd also discuss it with me over the phone. I tended to ask questions rather than to have him assume I got the idea. Well... Uh, Tomb of uh, uh, Dracula had a very frightening face to me. And I was trying to think of, without dreaming it up, is there anyone that I've ever seen on film that would really be a true Dracula figure? And I came upon, in my own mind, of Jack Palance. I thought he would be great. He has that kind of bone structure in his face, and he certainly can be frightening. So that's uh, that was the character that I used of to, um, uh, as a model uh, for, for Dracula. Dracula encountered the werewolf by night in a crossover story beginning in the Tomb of Dracula number 18 and continuing the same month in Werewolf by Night number 15. With both chapters written by Wolfman, a brief meeting between Dracula and Spider-Man occurred in the first issue of Giant Size Spider-Man. The Tomb of Dracula number 44 featured a crossover story with Doctor Strange number 14, another series which was being drawn by Colin at the time. The Tomb of Dracula ran for 70 issues until August 1979. Comics historian Les Daniels noted that, with an unbroken run of 70 issues over the course of more than seven years, Marvel's The Tomb of Dracula was the most successful comic book series to feature a villain as its title character. As cancellation loomed, Wolf man made to wrap up the storyline and lingering threads by issue number 72. But Jim Shooter, then the editor-in-chief, retroactively cut two issues after the artwork had been completed for three. As Wolfman recalled, I think I realized we were doing a finite story, and to continue that storyline would have pushed it into repetition. I wrote the final three issues and they were drawn. Jim was someone that when he liked you, there was nothing he wouldn't do for you. And when he didn't, there was nothing he would do. He and I had butted heads often since I had been editor-in-chief before him. And I was also the editor of The Tomb of Dracula, which rankled him as I didn't have to listen to his ideas. Anyway, I said the stories were done and I needed the room. He gave me a double-sized last issue. I really needed a triple-sized book. I was stuck and to find a way to cut 14 pages from the printed book. Thank God I hadn't dialogued them all yet. So I cut up pages, rearranged stuff, and then dialogued it so it read smoothly. Twelve of those pages which Wolfman had saved as photocopies appeared in the hardcover reprint collection Tomb of Dracula Omnibus, Volume 2. 
It's more interesting to me how people react to evil mm -hmm. and horror and situations than the person causing it. Uh, I, I could not be about Dracula because you'd, you'd wind up with very little to write after a while. You would have solved all the major things, but when you're writing about other people and their reactions to what's going on, that's endless because there are all these different people who are going to react differently and they all then play off of each other as well. The series culminated with the death of Quincy Harker and Dracula's apparent death and dispersal. In 2010, Comics Bulletin ranked Wolfman, Cullen, and Palmer's run on the two of Dracula fifth on its list of the top 10 1970s Marvels. A black and white magazine, Dracula Lives, published by Marvel's Monster Group, ran from 1973 to 1975. Dracula Lives ran 13 issues, plus a reprint annual, running concurrently with Tomb of Dracula. The continuities of the two titles occasionally overlapped, with storylines weaving between the two. Most of the time, the stories in Dracula Lives were standalone tales, including the serialized adaptation of the original Bram Stoker novel in 10-12 to 12 page installments written by Roy Thomas and drawn by Dick Giordano. Tomb of Dracula was supplemented by a giant-sized companion quarterly that ran for five issues in the mid-1970s. Uh, in 1935, the most frightening thing I ever saw was uh, Frankenstein. I was five years old. I know that my father took me to see it. It was a, the, it, it really um, influenced me tremendously at five. And of course, all children at five are, are very influenced about what they see. And it frightened the bejeepers out of me. I, I never forgot it. It traumatized me for a long, long time. And of course, that had a segue into uh, comics. Maybe it wasn't such a big mistake. Maybe if I had never seen it, I would uh, never be in this business. From my comic shop, cover art by Pablo Marcus, new Dracula story, call them triad, call them death, script by Chris Claremont, pencils by Don Heck, inks by Frank McLaughlin, Dracula and Kate Frazier battle the Elder Gods triad, the girl in the black hood, reprinted from Tales to Astonish number 32, script by Larry Lieber, art by Don Heck, a famous photographer never allows anyone to see her face, a criminal tries to rob her and forces her to remove her hood, only to discover that she is actually Medusa when he has turned to stone. On with the Dance, reprinted from Menace No. 2, script by Stan Lee, art by Russ Heath. A dancer who wants a part threatens the girl who got it with a gun to resign. Unfortunately for her, the girl is a witch, and she hexes the dancer to dance in place without ever stopping until she starves to death. And artist John Byrne's first story for Marvel Comics, Dark Asylum, was published in Giant Size Dracula No. 5, June of 1975. The color titled Tomb of Dracula was succeeded by another black and white magazine also called Tomb of Dracula with stories also drawn by Gene Cullen. It lasted six issues from 1979 to 1980. Reflecting upon Dracula Lives, it was an American black and white horror comics magazine published by Magazine Management, a corporate sibling of Marvel Comics. The series ran 13 issues and one annual publication from 1973 to 1975 and starred the Marvel version of the literary vampire Dracula. A magazine rather than a comic book, it did not fall under the purview of the comics industry self censorship comics code authority allowing the title to feature stronger content such as moderate profanity partial nudity and more graphic violence than the color comics of the time featuring dracula stories running concurrently with the longer running marvel comic the tomb of dracula the continuities of the two titles occasionally overlapped with storylines weaving between the two most of the time however the stories in dracula lives were standalone dracula tales by various creative teams later issues of dracula lives featured a serialized adaptation of the original brand Stoker novel, written by Roy Thomas and drawn by Dick Giordano. Copyrighted is simply Dracula Lives, and commonly known as its trademark cover title, Dracula Lives. Following Dracula Lives' cancellation, an additional installment appeared in Marvel Preview No. 8, The Legion of Monsters, for a total of 76 pages comprising roughly one-third of the novel. About a 30-year hiatus, Marvel commissioned Thomas and Giordano to finish the adaptation and ran the reprinted and new material as the four-issue miniseries Stoker's Dracula, October 2004 to May 2005. The entire adaptation was collected by Marvel Illustrated in 2010. Now let's look at the uh, supporting cast. First, the ones that got the movie treatment, Blade. That was Marv Wolfman's suggestion as just a new character to bring into the Dracula series. 
And so I worked it out with him uh, on by the phone. And uh, we we came up with uh, the appearance of Blaze, just a good-looking uh, fellow, a black guy that uh, could uh, be strong enough and handsome enough to uh, be a, a vampire slayer. He certainly wasn't going to be a, an ugly character, but a, but a heroic figure. So I came up with with Blade as 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 he appeared in the books. Blade is a 1998 American superhero film directed by Stephen Norrington and written by David S. Goyer, based on the Marvel Comics character of the same name. The film stars Wesley Snipes in the title role with Stephen Dorff, Chris Christopherson, and In Bush Wright as supporting roles. In the film, Blade is a Dampier, a human with vampire strengths, but none of their weaknesses, who protects humans from vampires. Released on August 21, 1998, Blade became a commercial success by grossing $70 million at the U.S. box office and $131.2 million worldwide. Despite mixed reviews from film critics, the film received a positive reception from audiences and has since garnered a cult following. It is the first film in the Blade franchise, followed by two sequels, Blade II and Blade Trinity, both written by Goyer, who also directed the latter. Blade was a dark superhero film for its time. The success of Blade began Marvel's film success and set the stage for further comic book film adaptations. The character Blade was created in 1973 for Marvel Comics by writer Marv Wolfman and artist Gene Collin as a supporting character in the 1970s comic The Tomb of Dracula. The comic Blade used teakwood knives and was much more the everyman in his behavior and attitude. Though courageous and brave, he displayed flaws as well, such as an inability to get along with certain other supporting cast members and a hatred of vampires that bordered on fanaticism. The character was not originally a daywalker, but a human being immune to being turned into a vampire. Lacking the superhuman speed and strength of his undead quarry, he relied solely on his wits and skill until he was bitten by the character Morbius, as seen in Peter Parker's Spider-Man No. 8, first published in August 1999. The film portrayal of Blade was updated for a 1990s audience and the comics character was subsequently modified to match. The film's version of Deacon Frost also differs greatly from his comic counterpart. Although the movie retains Frost's upstart ambitions, he was a great deal younger and more updated for the 90s. Blade, the television series, ran from June to September 2006. It was based on the Marvel Comics character and film series taking place after the events of Blade Trinity. The show premiered on Spike June 28, 2006. Sticky Fingers starred in the title role along with Jill Wagner as Krista Starr, Neil Jackson as Marcus Van Syver, Jessica Gower as Chase, and Nelson Lee is Shen. New Line Cinema, alongside Warner Brothers, is the distributor of the series, as they had the rights for the distribution prior to the Disney buyout of Marvel. The two-hour pilot was directed by Peter O'Fallon, from a script by David S. Goyer, who wrote all three feature films, and Jeff Johns. And now let's look at Deacon Frost, who is a fictional character appearing in Americomic books published by Marvel Comics. He appears in the Tomb of Dracula and is an enemy of Blade. In the comics, Deacon Frost was depicted as a tall, white-haired, late middle-aged gentleman gentleman with red eyes and wearing an 1860s Germany period clothing. His doppelganger sported an accent and attire that suggested a southern preacher. The character appeared in the 1998 film Blade, portrayed by Stephen Dorff. Deacon Frost was allegedly a scientist looking for the key to immortality. For one of his experiments, he kidnapped a young woman in order to inject his victim with the blood of a recently killed vampire. The girl's fiancé broke into the lab, and in the resulting scuffle, Frost was accidentally injected with the blood himself. The result was that Frost became a vampire. But, due to the unusual method of becoming one, he was endowed with a unique characteristic. Anyone he turned into a vampire would generate a doppelganger. He could create an unlimited number of doppelgangers by biting each doppelganger, and they would all be under his mental control. Frost intended to use his ability to contend for the position of Lord of Vampires, a position that was presently held by Dracula. Frost is the vampire responsible for the death of Blade's mother. Blade's initial mission is to exact revenge against her killer. It was also Frost who turned Hannibal King into a vampire. Blade and King, while initially distrusting each other, eventually teaming up to fight Frost's army of doppelgangers of Blade and King. The two of them managed to defeat and apparently destroy Frost in his underground hideout, stabbing him twice and leaving his body to be consumed as his hideout exploded. Many years later, Blade encountered a vampire that called itself Deacon Frost. This vampire had 
provided different appearance and personality to the original and was later identified as being a doppelganger. Deacon Frost appeared as the main antagonist of the 1998 film Blade, portrayed by Stephen Dorff. This depiction was a younger and more updated version for the 90s. While retaining his upstart ambitions, his main objective was to become the vampire god La Magra and rid the world of humans, believing it belongs to the vampire race. After killing the House of Erebus leaders as part of the ritual, Blade and Karen Johnson spoiled Frost's plans, despite their efforts. However, Frost managed to complete the ritual and be one with La Magra, engaging Blade in a sword battle. During the fight, Blade managed to gain the upper hand, cutting off Frost's right arm and then proceeded to cut him in half, only for Frost's top half to reconnect and regrow his right arm. But after a standoff, Frost was finally killed by Blade's use of EDTA darts, which caused him to explode. Other characters in the series included Quincy Harker, son of Jonathan Mina, and disabled leader of the Vampire Hunters. He died in battle with Dracula. Rachel Van Helsing was the granddaughter of Abraham Van Helsing and leader of the Vampire Hunters upon Harker's death. She was turned into a vampire by Dracula and subsequently given a mercy killing by Wolverine of the X-Men. Frank Drake is a descendant of Dracula and charter member of Quincy Harker's Vampire Hunters. Note, Drake's bloodline is based on one of Dracula's marriages prior to his vampirism. Taj Natal, a mute Indian Muslim vampire hunter of considerable strength, sufficient to temporarily restrain Dracula, whose son Audrey was vampirized and who was later transformed into a vampire and destroyed in Night Stalker's number 18. Saffron Calder, a showgirl from London and Blade's recurring girlfriend. She sometimes found herself a typical damsel in distress, but was always rescued by Blade despite an instance when he was nearly tricked into staking her. Lilith is a daughter of Dracula, an immortal vampire who was cursed to never die until her father was permanently destroyed. When slain, she was reborn into the body of an innocent woman who wanted her father dead. Harold H. Harold is a hack writer who befriended the vampire hunters in an effort to get material for a book he was writing. He fell victim to Dracula and became a vampire in Howard the Duck magazine number no. 5. Though this did not stop him from becoming a successful Hollywood film producer, like all vampires, he perished as a result of the casting of the Montesi formula. Then there was Anton Lepesky, a satanic priest through whom Dracula manipulated a cult while impersonating Satan. Also Domini, a member of Anton Lepesky's cult, whom Dracula chose as his bride. Janus is the son of Dracula in Domini, who was possessed by an angel. He was returned to his child form at age five, was kidnapped by the vampire Varney in the backstory of Night Stalkers number 16 through 18. Varney was the first vampire and at one point enemy of Conan the Barbarian. He was the lord of the vampires prior to Dracula, and although he died in the process of making Dracula his heir, he was later revived. He was inspired by the 19th century character Varney the Vampire. Nimrod I was another Lord of the Vampires prior to Dracula, who killed him in Nimrod's first appearance, Dracula Lives No. 3. When Dracula's origin was revised in Bizarre Adventures No. 33, Nimrod was no longer the true Lord of the Vampires. Instead, he was a mentally imbalanced servant of Varney and had been empowered by his master as a test of Dracula's worthiness. Mina is the mother of Quincy and the wife of Count Dracula. She died in a great battle, but she was turned into a vampire by her beloved Count Dracula. She acts like a human rather than a vampire. She is the Queen of Romania. And that's all the time we have this week for Comics Let's Talk. Hope you enjoyed the program. That was our last look at the character of Dracula in the world of comic books. Uh, someday I'm thinking of doing a show from uh, the Penny Dreadful series, following that series character of Count Dracula in the world of Titan comic books. But for now, that was our final look at the character of Count Dracula. If you love comics as much as I do, you're going to subscribe to my channel. I review comics for Comic Crusaders. I also have my own franchises, Adolescent Radioactive Samurai Platypi and Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter. They're available on Comics Central, Indie Planet, and Comixology. Check them out. Stay tuned to this broadcast for more information. Also, like the Facebook pages for each franchise. Check out my Patreon site for some neat original artwork and shows that you won't find on YouTube. Until next time, this is Kevin Gibbons saying so long and keep reading those comics.